Without further ado, we're going to take a right turn into some serious stuff with our panel on disaster reporting. And this will be moderated by Madison Park, uh, AJ member and also at uh, CNN.com. So Madison, please take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Madison. I'm from the CNN Bureau here in Hong Kong. And we have a really fascinating panel today with a diverse array of journalists who have covered some of the most devastating situations in the world, from the war in Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, and Ty Typhoon Haiyan, as well as um, the latest outbreak of violence in Ukraine. Um, we're going to have the speakers introduce themselves. I've put their Twitter handles up there in case you want to follow them or ask them any questions after the panel or even after the conference. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to pass this on to Silvio, and he's going to sort of explain his bio and also what kind of conflicts and uh, wars he's covered, basically. All right. Hi. Um, so <laughs> my name is Silvio Carrillo. Um, I started uh, at CNN in a long time ago. I don't even want to say when. Um, but I started in the library, and next thing I know, 15 years later, I was in Iraq. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty amazing uh, trajectory um, where I saw a lot of stuff that was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and uh, now, now I'm at SCMP uh, as a multimedia journalist, sorry, senior multimedia editor. Um, and I love my job. I'm working with uh, people your age, um, and uh, they amaze me every day. Um, I don't know what else you want me to say. Uh, no. Hi everyone, my name is um, Agnès, so I'm a French video reporter for Agence France Presse, an international news agency. Um, I'm not really a war reporter, uh, I wouldn't say that, like someone like Kevin or Silvio, I don't have that much experience, I just covered the, the tensions in Ukraine, uh, I'm actually just back from three weeks in Ukraine, mostly in the, in the east. Uh, yeah, probably was a good first experience, pretty intense. Uh, and before that, I also covered the typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. I uh, arrived right after the typhoon hit the city uh, of Tacloban, and that was also very, very intense. Uh, and before that, I worked briefly in Cambodia, uh, where I was almost shot, so that's pretty intense, I guess, too. Um, sh should I show a video now? Or yeah, so. Oh, <laughs> good. Uh, so I'm going to show you a video uh, that I haven't seen too often, actually. I shot it a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a video of a gunfight between the Ukrainian army and the pro-Russian rebels in Ukraine. And unfortunately, I was right in the middle of the, of the gunfight, which is the worst case scenario that can happen with the Ukrainian army shooting from the front and the rebels shooting from the back. And it's, uh, it's not going to be a very funny video, I'm afraid. Uh, you're going to see uh, dead bodies. Two people were shot dead next to me. Uh, it's just to give you an idea of what we have to film sometimes when we go to these type of places. And I apologize for the, um, apologies for the audio. There's no audio because when I was running to avoid the bullet, my uh, mic just unplugged itself. And I only discovered it later, which was very frustrating. There's going to be a mute video. So this is the someone who basically says to get out of here because they were starting to fire already, but it was too late for us, so we couldn't, we couldn't get out. So this is the checkpoint. You can see the Ukrainian army at the back. Uh, so there, there are mortar shells that are being fired right now. Uh, yeah, so you can't hear it, but now you have bullets that were just flying only less than a meter away from me, actually, at that moment. Um, so, yeah, so that was it. And, or maybe you can fast forward it a bit. If you, yeah, so uh, this guy is a civilian who was shot in the legs, and unfortunately we couldn't uh, save him because the bullets were flying just above his head. It's, oh, so this guy was shot, this car actually arrived just after our car, and, we tried, we tried to save that person, but he died a few minutes later, unfortunately. These are the rebels who were shooting uh, behind us. So this is the guy who was shot dead in the car, just a few meters away from us. 
Um, so it's really a case of bad luck. We were the only reporters there. The situation was very quiet when we arrived. And all of a sudden, it got really, really tense. Uh, so this person was wounded. He was also a passenger of the car. And yeah, so we're trying to drag these people to safe zone. But it was a bit too late, unfortunately. So, oh, I wasn't. Oh, no, I was right in the middle of it. And then I had to run to avoid the bullets and the explosions. And I kept filming at the same time. I was filming and while well, they were shooting, yeah. So, yeah, just to give you an idea of the kind of uh, reporting we have to do uh, in these type of places. I think we all disagree with Agnes's earlier assumption that she's not a war reporter. After you see that, right? That was a pretty powerful video. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Some of you, I think, are my students or former students here. And as you know, I love PowerPoint, so I'm going to give you a quick PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to lighten this up just a bit. Um, As AJ's doing that, I'll just give you a little bit of my background. Um, I wanted to be a journalist forever, and I got my wish. Um, some days I wish my wish didn't come true. Some days I absolutely you know, loved my job. I ended up being a war reporter by accident. Um, worked at NBC News and started working with the Pentagon correspondent who got sent to war zones. So I got sent to war zones. Once you got some experience doing that, they don't let you um, come home. They keep you in that loop for a long time. And it was interesting. Um, and, in, and in some ways, I found it remarkably easy. Um, covering war is inherently dramatic. It gives you the video that you need. It gives you the shots. Uh, making sense of what actually happens out there is much more difficult. Uh, the process, the nuances, uh, the things that aren't inherently dramatic, the, uh, the refugee camps, uh, the collateral damage, how do you make that um, actually as interesting to your viewers and your audience as the actual bang bang. You know, I found out very well and early that whenever I got in the middle of a firefight, I ended up on the evening news with Brokaw or with Brian Williams. Whenever I ended up in a refugee camp, I was on MSNBC, you know, so it went down a notch. Um, what I want to show you now, would, would you mind advancing this for me? Um, I, I've come up with a guide for you. And I hope you can all take out your uh, pen and paper and some notes, because I, I've, I've given you five steps to, it's called, called the Modern Journal's Guide to War and Disaster. And so this will help you as you decide whether you want to proceed in this career or not. Step number one, pick the right war or disaster stone. So and if you could advance one more time, AJ. Afghanistan, OK. The next one, please. Syria, oh, hell no. Very dangerous, don't want to go there. Step two, pitch the media that matches your content. Vice Magazine, yes. Cat Fancy, no. <laughs> Step number three, pack smart. Stylish, not smart. This is not the way that you want to pack. Smart, not stylish. This was my kit before I went to Afghanistan. Three pairs of pants, three shirts. Um, my DSLR, my camcorder, fold flat tripod, uh, water purifier, uh, MacBook Air, a couple of hard drives, helmet, black vest, that kind of thing. Definitely not stylish. Okay. Step number four: dress appropriately. This. Next one, please. Yes, when necessary, you have to wear this body armor. You have to wear the things that protect you. But you look like a combatant. Next one. Yes, when really necessary. Sometimes you have to blend in with the locals. You want to make sure that you look appropriate. I went from both of those uh, you know, in the same actual trip. And finally, this, go ahead, absolutely never. Never come with a SAM-7 underneath your legs. Okay. So yes, the body armor, uh, you can dress locally, um, you know, looking like uh, the locals. To blend in a little bit, you've got to grow your beard, but never, never come with a bomb between your legs. Okay, next step. And number five, report, write, produce, rinse, and repeat. This process 
it is difficult in the field, and you have to be able to be prepared mentally to do it, um, physically to get out there and work it. But ultimately, it's about getting good material on the ground. So we can move one more step, AJ. Uh, seriously, I want to give you the real steps now. Step one, become a strong pitcher. This is one thing that I've seen uh, with a lot of my students is that we don't know how to pitch a story. You have to think about what people are looking for out there. Um, you may have what you think is a really good idea, but is it visceral? Does it move? Does it have a human element to it? Is it something people are going to want to watch or read? Do you want to watch or read it? If you're going to be bored by your own pitch, then I can almost guarantee you that an editor is not going to want to read it. Number two, uh, find the best fixer you can. The person that's looking over my shoulder right now, does anybody recognize this guy? This is Mateen. He is actually a graduate of this master's program here at HKU. He was one of my students, and I gave him his first job um, in Afghanistan. I went there, and I reported there last summer, and I hired him to be my fixer and translator. And you know, Mateen was awesome, both as a student and as a fixer, because you need a very strong person, someone that can help you navigate you know, both the political and the very real minefields of these war zones that you're going to. Okay? Tell visceral, unconventional multimedia stories. Um, you may not want to learn how to use a video camera or a still camera. You have to use it. Uh, you do. You may not be a master at it. You may find that you know, you're better at one of these skills than the other. But we need to be able to provide stories that are media rich, that live in three dimensions rather than just one dimension. Because that's the way we report today. And that's the way that we, you know, our audiences demand this of us. Maximize your news gathering time. This is one very good tip. When you're in the field, you don't want to be doing a lot of post-production. You want to be out there gathering news while things are happening. Agnes was in Ukraine. She doesn't want to be you know, somewhere back in the hotel room editing when there's things going on in front of her. So you want to maximize that time. Collect all of your news. Get all of your information first. Do the post-production later. Minimize your post-production time. If you can, you could do this back at home. If you're filing from the field, you do it at night when you're supposed to be sleeping. Finally. Leverage your work across vertical and linear mediums. Uh, I'll give you a good example of this. I got hired by Vice Magazine uh, last summer. And initially, I went um, just to, to blog for them, you know, to work on their website. And I ended up doing, uh, next slide, please. I ended up doing um, uh, 14 blog posts for them, video clips, uh, photos, and, and 14 kind of short stories. That turned into, uh, if you could advance it, AJ. Um, that turned into a 7,000-word magazine article and 20 photos. And then one more, it turned into a book for HarperCollins because I, I decided, hey, I have a lot of material here. It didn't even fit in 7,000 words. In fact, the first draft that I wrote was almost 30,000. That's only 50,000 short of a book. So I thought, OK, 50,000 more, I can make it. And then it got optioned for uh, you know, a, television, a, a potential television show. So this started out with Vice Magazine for blog posting paying me a flat sum fee of a very small amount. Those of you that freelance here know that, you know, especially a magazine like Vice that has people all over the world, usually young journalists, they pay you a small amount. You have to cover everything, your fixers, your travel, um, all of the things that you need to survive out there. But over time, I gathered enough material and was able to leverage that down the line uh, into uh, you know, both traditional media, a book, you know, and potentially um, you know, multimedia. TV series as well. So you have to gather all of that material and put it to work for you. I think that's what it takes to actually do all this out there. So remember the five steps first, and then remember this. Okay. Great. Um, we're going to go through some questions. We'll keep it tight and bright. And uh, hopefully, at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes to take audience questions. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask, what kind of preparation or training did you have before you ended up in you know, a disaster zone or a war zone, and how much of that was helpful once you got there? Yes. Um, we went on what's called AKE training, um, and uh, it's, a comp it's a company, sorry, it's a company that offers uh, all this war training stuff. I think you guys did the same thing. You probably went through it too. Yeah. And um, I, I did mine in, in Georgia somewhere, and um, as, as good as it was, I learned a lot of first aid stuff, but the reality, it's just there's nothing you know, to train you for reality. So, um, you know, it was great, we had a lot of fun, but then, you know, the next thing I know, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm driving into Baghdad, and 
I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, I was wide-eyed, you know. There was a woman in the car with me, and uh, she was from the London Bureau, and she's pale skin, red hair. She was freaking out the whole time. Meanwhile, me with my, sorry, me with my complexion, um, I honestly didn't think about my complexion, but I wasn't, I wasn't concerned. I just didn't know what was going on. And um, eventually I got it. Um, it took a pretty bad tragedy, but I got it. Once I got into the Bureau, I realized this is a big deal. You know, this, is, this isn't just covering hurricanes. You know, you kind, of, you kind of make jokes sometimes even about covering hurricanes in the news. But um, this was a big, really big deal. Yeah, I did, um, I did a hostile environment training as well. Uh, it is useful, actually. Um, it teaches you the basics. I had to run to avoid fake sniper shots. And I, when I really had to run to avoid bullets, it did come back, uh, all the things I learned. So it does help, but as Silvia says, when you're really in the middle of it, nothing prepares you for that. Um, I remember when I arrived in Tacloban. So I arrived right after the typhoon hit the city, and there was no no rescuers, no soldiers. We were really the first people on the ground, the first military plane to reach Tacloban. And I remember that the doors of the plane opened, and we were just among reporters, soldiers, NGO workers, we were all jogging in the plane because we were exhausted already. And I remember there was this big silence when the doors opened, because the airport, there was no airport anymore. Uh, nothing was standing. Um, and there were just uh, people wandering around with open wounds on their heads, children with no parents because the parents died. Um, nothing prepares you for that. I've seen movies, I've, I've, I've read stories. Um, when you're in the middle of it, it's just like a big slap in the face. And what you have to do in that case, it's just, in my case, it's just to take my camera and start to work. Otherwise, you just go crazy because you're just overwhelmed. You're in the middle of it. You don't know for how long you're going to be there. There's just so much immediate pain, misery, suffering people dead or suffering, and there's nothing you can do but take your camera, start to shoot, and start to give a meaning to your presence here, because otherwise there's no point in being here just to see people dying around you. So for me, it really helped to have, to go back to this routine, because I know my job, I know how to shoot, I know how to, it really helps, it's almost like a filter, because you're like, okay, I have to focus on the light, I have to focus, um, do the focus, check the audio, and this routine helps you to, to actually um, to transition between being a human being who's completely overwhelmed by the situation to back to being a reporter who's actually here for a mission, uh, and it, it really helps. So I think it's, the preparation helps. I think it's really important to give reporters some kind of training, but nothing will prepare you for that first moment. When you arrive out there, it can be combat zone, it can be disaster zone, um, it's just a natural human reaction. I think it's actually quite sane to be to be like that completely, you know, um, to lose it completely a bit. But then you have to be able to go back to this reporter routine if you want to give sense to it. I'd agree with uh, both Silvio and Agnes that um, you're not really prepared mentally the first time you see it, but the preparation is actually very, very helpful. Um, for instance, in, in Iraq, uh, I had been given hustle environment training by CNN prior to going in, and we were actually captured for a short period of time. And I remember in my hostile environment training, I played one of the captors, you know, one of the hostage takers. Um, and I, I guess I played it to the point where I actually made one of the reporters cry. Um, but I, I got into that mindset, you know, um, separate them from the rest of the group, get them scared. Uh, and it's exactly what they tried to do with us. You know, they put us into... Um, what they call an execution position, when you're on your knees and you have a gun pointed to your head, um, and you think, well, there's no way you're going to get out of this. But later on, they, they kind of moved us from that position, and they tried to separate us uh, to make you weak. And then you realize you can't do that. You can't allow yourself to be separated. Uh, they were taking away our, our translator, which would have been really a death sentence for us. So we grabbed him, and we just held on to him. We didn't fight them, but we held on to his legs and kept him with us. And really, this man ended up saving our lives. Our translator ended up you know, bargaining for our freedom. And if we would have let him be taken away, and they were going to shoot him instantly. He was, a, um, you know, he was someone that was very hated. Uh, he was a Kurd. Um, and they called him a double traitor, you know, working with Americans and being a Kurd. And so um, eventually, you know, we kept him with us 
and he, he saved our lives. So that training that we did have ended up, I think, is the reason I'm here today. So I think it's really important in some ways, even though you're right, it can't prepare you for what you're going to see. So like we saw on Agnes's footage, you know, these scenes are incredibly chaotic and disorienting, and there are, you know, contradictory information and rumors flying around everywhere. So how do you get a grasp of what is really going on, and how do you cut through all that, you know, confusion? That's, that's difficult because, uh, you know, just like during Katrina, all kinds of crazy information was coming up. This, this better? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't want you to hear me. Um, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of crazy information was coming out. We didn't know what was true, what wasn't true. All I could see was what was in front of me. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't know what's going on sometimes, but um, I, I won't. I don't have to tell another long anecdote, but we were on top of a bridge, uh, I-10, and it was, I think, the, it was the day after all the flooding came through, and there was, must have been like 10 of us, two cars, two CNN cars, and we're stuck. We couldn't get off the overpass because it was flooding all over the place, all around us. And um, if you know uh, I-10, it's elevated, so it's above the area. The rest of it was all flooded, and there was a lot of people who whose homes had been destroyed and didn't have anywhere to be but on a highway, basically. So they were just hanging out. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any water. There was two sets of vans, CNN, that was fully equipped with water and probably some snacks. And it was a bad situation. Um, you know, it was about 48 hours after the flooding had started. What do you do? You know, our Blackberries were kind of working. Uh, phones, kind of working, but no other way to, to, to communicate and find out what's really happening on the ground around. We ended up evacuating the next day. Um, four people stayed, and that was when um, there was a lot of shooting and a lot of looting and a lot of, uh, a lot of incidents happened, apparently. I don't know what the answer is. You know, you just, you just have to make sure that you're, sur you're, you're safe and you're doing your job, as Agnes was pointing out, you know, you get into it, you get stuck, and you do it, and, and you try to make it out of there. Like you, you, we did, we got really lucky, and we have, we have the fortune of being able to say, of, of you know, CNN pulling us out. Those people don't, don't have homes, probably, a lot of them still today, um, but you have, to, you have to just get into it and get out, and, and I, I honestly, I don't know what the answer is, but it, you work off of your experience. And um, I had a lot of experience by then uh, at CNN, and, and you now have, you know, a lot of good experience. I know Kevin does too. I think it depends because when you arrive in a disaster zone, you don't. Phone lines are not working. There's not even electricity, so it's really tricky because there's nothing ex you can do except talking to the people there, and you hear so many rumors and uh, just circumstances. You hear that there's a mass grave here. You hear that, you know, there's going to be a burial here. Uh, that the res rescuers are going to arrive there. It's really, really hard to be honest. Uh, I guess even with experience, it's really hard. You just have to talk to as many locals as possible. Uh, to you have to talk to the other reporters as well. In these circumstances, there's no competition. To be honest, uh, every time I was out there on the field, every time we had something, we would call the other reporters uh, and get there. Sometimes it's you know, it's a matter of life and death. So you can't say, oh, we are AFP, and we're not going to alert them uh, if, you know, things start to be fishy at that checkpoint. So when I was in Ukraine, it was different because we had um, social media. It actually helps because we went to several checkpoints, and sometimes we could see on Twitter that the reporters who went there just before us were abducted, detained, or beaten up. So we would change our... Um, direction just based on that. We were not even sure whether it was true or not, but it really helps. And I strongly encourage people to use social media, even if you can't entirely rely on it. When I was in Ukraine, every time there was a gunfight or an explosion, you first learn it on Twitter. And if you have a hundred tweets saying explosions in Slavians, chances are that it might, it might be true. So it's a good first, you know, first base information, and then you have to work on it, you have to call people to verify it, but I think it's a, it's a very good tool and it's very important that we use it when we can. Then for disaster zones, I think it's the hardest situation ever 
because you're really out there on your own and there's no way you can call people or check anything. So then you really have to be careful because it's, it's not about working anymore. It's about uh, your safety, actually. So it's very important. Um, logistics question. Silvio touched on this a little bit. When you're in a disaster zone um, and we're talking debris, you know, trash, everything blocking the roads, you don't know where you're going to get, you know, fresh water, you can't really get gasoline anywhere. How do you get from point A to point B? Is this a point where you have to, you know, call into the main office and try to figure out where you can get supplies? Can you talk a little bit about some of the logistics behind getting to these places and moving around? I think um, that speaks to the idea of having a good fixer. Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but you know, you're really a, an infant in these countries, especially if you don't speak the language. You know, unfortunately, that's my situation in pretty much everywhere, even in my own country. Um, but you, you need them to translate for you, you know, not just literally what's being said, but the nuances of what are, what's actually happening around you. Um, and, and you have to be very clear with your fixer, not, not just logistically getting from point A to point B, but getting from concept A to concept B. Um, a lot of times they want to protect you from what someone's saying. You know, someone may be calling me an asshole or you know, saying you know, Americans are, are terrible people or, or whatever it is, and, and he doesn't want to say that to me. And I said, no, you have to tell me everything they say. You know, I, I want to understand that because I think that's going to help me tell uh, you know, a true and authentic story here. And you know, I, I said this to Mateen while we were traveling through Afghanistan. I said, I'm your big American baby. You, know, you feed me, you take me from place to place, you know, and I ask these questions constantly. That's all I do. You know, you're the adult in this, in this relationship, and that's, that's kind of how it works. So Kevin, how do you find these fixers and translators, and how do you know you can trust them? Well, you know, in, in the situation of Afghanistan, Mateen was my student, so <laughs> I, felt, I felt pretty safe with him. Um, in a lot of cases, and Sylvia, this may be the same situation for you, you've worked with people over the years. I've worked with a fixer in Afghanistan since 2001. I work with him every time that I go back. And so you have people that you trust and you rely on, and you know they're following the story because they're living that story. And so that becomes important. You go to places where you may not have experience. And using the internet can help you in that situation. There's a, a program called Light Stalkers uh, that lists freelancers, photographers, uh, translators. Um, there's something called the Vulture Club and the New Vulture Club. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, on Facebook. It's a Facebook secret group. You know, it's not that secret. Everybody seems to know about it. But if you've been to, are, are you part of that? <laughs> if, you've, if you've been to a war zone, you're probably on the Vulture Club or the new Vulture Club. And then you ask people, hey, you know, I'm going to Ukraine. Do you have somebody that, that you can set me up with? But you use resources. Yeah, I think um, though a lot of those fixers, actually, I, I have a professor. I had a professor in uh, film school who never liked to use that term. And we use it a lot. It's a common term. But they are actually producers. I mean, they are, they are the most amazing producers, too, because they work in a war zone day in and day out. So these guys know the ins and outs of where you are, and you are, you're, you're, you're their baby, you know, you're a baby in their hands. So they are, they are the most important person in the room always. Um, and they will, you know, uh, the good ones will not only get you to point A to point B, but will feed your crew, will help you feed your crew. If you guys, that is one of the most important things I've learned, actually if not the most important thing, is you feed your cameraman, you feed Whoever is with you, you feed your team, you take care of your team. They will work together with you if they know you are working for them. That's key, and you have to watch out for their safety. So I'm going to change subjects a little bit. Um, you know, when you get to these areas, disaster areas or war areas, a lot of these people are pretty much experiencing the worst moment in their lives. How do you get them to talk to you? probably the hardest thing to do. So it depends actually. When I was in the Philippines, it wasn't hard at all because people were in shock and they actually needed to talk to someone. And sometimes I met people and I was the first person they could actually talk to. And it, always, it was always very weird because the Filipino people are very smiley. So they just lost their house, they lost relatives, but they tried to, you know, the brave face. So they start the interview and it was, you know, they're, they're very smiley. And then there's always a moment where they, the fact that they talk about it for the first time, for the first time they say, I lost my house, uh, my parents died, my children died, it just makes them realize what happened. 
Because when it happens to you, you just need some time to digest it. And sometimes your, your brain just doesn't compute right away. But the fact that they're standing in front of a camera talking to a person and saying this kind of thing. And I saw a lot of people uh, just completely break down right in front of my camera. And it's, it's very, very sad. You see their face, it literally crumbles. They, they, they just, yeah, the very fact that they talk to you about it makes them realize what the situation is. And at the same time, it's good for them. They always ended up thanking me because I always felt guilty about making them cry, even if I wasn't responsible for the situation. But I felt like I was putting you know, their head into it. But they always ended up thanking me because they need to talk to someone about it. So for disaster zones, at least in the Philippines, I didn't have that problem. Then in Ukraine, it's a bit different. You, a lot of people don't like foreign reporters there. It's actually really hard to get interviews. They think that we're not going to say, to tell the truth. They think that we are going to side with the opposite side, for instance. Um, sometimes you can't push it, to be honest. Uh, and we talked about the language thing. Um, I didn't speak Russian when I went to Ukraine or Ukrainian. And at some point I wanted to do an interview with a rebel fighter. And he seemed to be very quiet and you know, very cool about it. And the text reporter who speaks Russian all of a sudden took my arm and just looked at me and it meant we have to get out of here. And he then later told me that this guy, who seemed to be very quiet and very you know, peaceful, was saying, oh, um, I want to slice the throat of a reporter. And he kept saying that all the time in Russian, like looking at me straight in the eyes and saying that. But I didn't understand any word of what he was saying and so I kept wanting to interview him. And so this is the case when you really need uh, a good fixer or a reporter who can speak the language and tell you when it's when it's getting really tense and tell you how to get out of here. So it depends on the situation, I guess. I think that's certainly true in disaster zones. In, in war zones, um, it can be a bit different. And, and we have to be careful not to look at everyone as a victim. In fact, the people that we're interviewing are probably stronger than us. You know, they live in a place where they're dealing with gunfire and they're dealing with difficulties every single day. And I've seen more reporters break down than I've seen you know, people in those situations. They, they can be very strong. And I think to report on them authentically, we have to respect that strength. You know, we haven't earned the right to cry there yet. You know, we may want to, but we haven't earned it. Um, you know, there are people that are dealing with this on a, a, a daily basis. What we need to get from them is how do you deal with it? You know, this might break us down. This might make us you know, blubbering idiots. How do you deal with a situation in Syria where you just lost your child, or you just lost your house, or you just lost your parents, um, or you haven't eaten in a week? Um, and you know, that's our role to, to find those things out, and it can be a difficult process. And I think by displaying natural curiosity and real authentic interest, rather than just showcasing ourselves as, as the center of the story, but really reflecting back on them um, what's going on there, they will respond to that, and they do want to talk to you, and they do want to share their story, regardless of how difficult it is, because maybe it's not that difficult for them to tell you what they've been through, because they've been enduring it for a long time. So Kevin, this is a question for you. In today's world of mobile journalism, there's a lot of expectations put on journalists. They want you know, someone who can shoot video, someone who can get photos, who can write a story. And all at the same time, you know, they want updates on social media. So how do you juggle all these sort of priorities? And can you actually do it all, or is that unrealistic? That's a really good point. As I said earlier, you do have to be able to news gather in all of these mediums. You have to be able to shoot a photograph. You have to be able to shoot video. You have to be able to record sound. If you can record video, you've got your sound already. Uh, I wouldn't advise using social media while you're covering a story unless you have you know, the latitude to do that. You know, you're, you're covering something. If you're in the middle of a gunfight, tweeting is not your best use of time. It's very temporary. It is. You, know, you want to do something enduring and make some meaning out of what you're seeing. Your reflection you know, or your instant observation uh, of 140 characters is great in your daily life. It's probably not so great when we're dealing with something a bit heavier where we have to digest it and process it and, and provide perspective and context. So gather that information. You may not even understand it while it's happening. You know, that's why live shots can be so dangerous. You know, you're, you're talking about things that you may not fully understand at the moment. Uh, you know, I've had to go back and look at video 
uh, or look at photographs, you know, for long periods of time to truly understand what they meant in a war zone. You know, and, and sometimes it takes that moment of introspection of, of you know, reliving that, um, that moment. Um, you're not going to be great at all of these things. I'm certainly not great at all of these things. You know, find something that you're really good at and increase that strength tenfold and then learn how to do all the other things in acceptable forms. Learn how to take a good picture. Learn what composition is, uh, saturation, color. Learn how to use your white balance, those kind of things. With video, if you set it on green and you cover the action, you're pretty much covered. You know, now most of you videographers out there are going to say, you know, shocked. You know, that's, that's heresy. You, you want to get better at it. But if it's a matter of, of capturing what's going on in front of you, that's better than nothing, having the image. So this is a question for everybody. Um, why do you keep going back? I mean, you can go back in different, you can go back in different forms. Uh, if you want to play the clip, the Vimeo clip. Um, it doesn't always have to be a war zone or you know a disaster area or whatever. Um, you may be doing something, uh, some work. For, I was doing work for NGO for an NGO. I went and filmed. A woman here asked me to go film a story about uh, the Rainbow Warrior, uh, which is the Greenpeace's Greenpeace's ship. The second one, the first one got blown up by the French, so they built a second one. The second one was being donated. Um, it was being donated to a nonprofit in Bangladesh who was uh, transforming it into a hospital ship. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Bangladesh is called the, like the center for climate change. This is, this is where the, the undeniable proof that there is climate change happening. Um, every year, people live in dunes, basically, in, in northern Bangladesh, and they flood when the waters from uh, the, uh, the Himalayas melt. And they, fl they flood in different, you know, different ways. It's worse some years than others. And so people who live on these chars, as they call them, um, their homes basically are on these little piles of sand that sometimes disappear. Sometimes they lose their homes. So they need these ships to go around, these um, ships to go around, provide hospital and uh, medical care. Um, is this it? No, this isn't it. It's a boat for Bangladesh. Anyway, I was shooting, um, and we, we had just come back from the north, and we were heading to the south, to Chittagong. And there was uh, one of the extremist uh, groups called for a strike. Had no idea this was going on because we were in the north, and we were driving back. And uh, it's just, it was, it was nuts. You know, they said, you, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., you cannot be on the roads, or else we are going to destroy your car, destroy anybody that's in the street, kill you, beat you, whatever. And it was me and uh, a woman from here. And uh, you know, we were stuck. The driver's like, well, we can't go. And then we're like, well, we have to, we have to fly out. And he said, well, all right, well, we have to leave at 5 o'clock in the morning, because he needed to get back. So 5 o'clock in the morning, we're up. And it's fog, complete and utter fog, the densest fog I have ever seen. We couldn't even drive to the airport. We begged the guy, and the guy ended up driving us. Actually, he's the one that said, oh, let's go, it's fine. We were kind of like, uh. Anyway, he took us. Uh, eventually, we made it. It was the densest fog I have ever seen, and he got back safely. But that day, two people died. Two people, like, at least two people were killed by this extremist group who refused to have people out on the streets that day. And, you know, I was just there shooting the, green, the ship for Greenpeace. You know, for that was going to another to a nonprofit, so it can happen anywhere, anytime, practically. You know? I don't know if it ever got. <laughs> uh, so when I was in Ukraine, I actually met a lot of very experienced war reporters, and I actually asked them, "Why do you go back?" Because they had scars from rockets, mortar shells, bullets, and sometimes I got the feeling that these people were actually addicted to danger. There is the adrenaline rush. I never ran that fast in my life when I had to, um, you know, avoid the bullets. And I was wearing a helmet, flat jacket, carrying the camera and everything. Uh, and I think that some people do go back for that. I'm not sure it's the right reason, to be honest, but there is, um, they told me that life seems very flat, actually, when you go back. So they keep going back to these places. As for me, I'm really not 
attracted to danger at all. If I can avoid to be in another gunfight, I'd be really happy. Uh, it's not the kind of thing I'm looking for. As you said, you know, the Bang Bang stories, you can find them everywhere. It doesn't say anything. It's always the same story about people shooting at each other. What does it say about the country? It could be in Syria, it could be in Afghanistan, it could be in Ukraine. It's the same story, and it's a boring story, and it's a sad story because people die. So what I like when I go to these places is that you actually get to meet the locals, and as you said, they're much stronger than us. They've been living there forever. They've, they know the explosions. The children know the caliber of weapons. It's scary. And just to be able to document these people, the, how brave they are, just because they, they keep on living, and how brave you have to be when you grow up in Slavyansk in Eastern Ukraine, for instance, that's fascinating. And to be able to witness history in the making is also something, as a reporter, that really keeps me going. It's like, I guess, witnessing the Berlin Wall or things like that. It's, it's powerful. And as reporters, we don't only get to witness it, witness it, we also record it. We also share these stories with the world. And I think that's a very important mission. And if we are still able to do it, we have to do it, I think. It's almost a duty for us. I was just going to mention, that, that's an incredible point. The, the fact is, these stories are easy. They're, they're not boring. Un unfortunately, they're not boring. Um, because if they were boring, we wouldn't watch them you know, so intently. Um, but they don't mean that much. A battle in Afghanistan, a battle in Syria, really does not determine the outcome of that war anymore. This is not the Middle Ages. You know, it's simply a street battle. Understanding the context behind that, the larger picture, why is this going on, uh, rather than just giving people war porn. Um, you know, how do we get beyond that as journalists? That is truly the question that we need to be discussing, not in this forum, but all over the world. Um, because there are armies of young journalists going to Syria and places like that because they think that's where they're going to get their street cred. And they do in some ways. You know, we give them the attaboys, and they are brave. Um, but are they contributing to this overall dialogue about the understanding of conflict? Do we really know why we fight? Do we know what the outcome of this is going to be? It's certainly not going to be determined in that gun battle. Uh, we have to figure out how do we cover the less inherently dramatic aspects of war, like collateral damage, civilians getting killed, in the same inherently dramatic way that we cover fighting. And we haven't figured that out yet. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up to the floor. Um, we talked a lot about going in, and I want to talk about going out, basically. How have you coped after leaving the zones, and have any of you had to deal with PTSD? Uh, I, you have, but I mean, I definitely did, but it was really, it was kind of a mild form. I have a better example. I mean, most, I have a friend who was in the Baghdad Bureau for CNN. She was there for uh, a year. And she, um, she comes to Hong Kong now. She works for another news organization. That was in, she was there from 2003 to 2004. She comes to Hong Kong now, and she comes over for dinner. After dinner, we have drinks. And for the next two hours, it's just like bawling, both of us. You know, it's, just, it's, it's mostly her because she was there for a year, and she experienced a hell of a lot more than I did. But this is, this is what she, you know, this, this is the result of that. And she's been a reporter for now for 15 years, and she's a, a fantastic one. Um, but it's hard. It's sometimes you just never let it go. I mean, you know, you read books today about war correspondents from Vietnam, and, uh, you know, they're still dealing with it years later. So um, how do you deal with it? You, I don't know. I, I, I had to get out. I felt like I had to get out because... I was like single in Washington D.C. and I, was like, I met this woman who was wonderful. We got married and had a kid, and then uh, I've I've moved on, and I'm very happy. I don't need to go into another war zone. I mean, I would do it, possibly <laughs> if I was allowed, um, but um, I, it just happens, it, and then it just depends on how you deal with it. Obviously, my friend has not really come to grips with it yet, but um, it, it, it it takes a lot for you to make that decision. Yeah, I think we also have to be careful because when you come back, everybody is very supportive and very nice because they expect you to be traumatized, and, and you probably are. 
But sometimes it takes a long time before it actually comes back to you. And by then, people around you actually forgot about it. And the hardest moment can be the most unexpected moment. It can be two years later, it can be 15 years later. I talked to a friend who's a war reporter, and he told me he covered a lot of combat zones and saw a lot of dead bodies when he was in his 20s, and nothing ever happened to him. And then when he was 35, he had a baby. And all of a sudden, he started to have nightmares about it, about all these bodies that he saw, all these dead babies, all these cadavers. And he told me that story because he wanted to tell me to be careful about it. It's not because you're right two weeks later, six months later, a year later, that you're going to be fine forever. It's the kind of thing that stays with you, and it's, that's the deal. You never, you never forget about this, no matter how hard you try. And I'm not even sure we should try to forget it, actually. Um, but so it's always with us, and we have to be very careful to know when it's too much. I think every reporter has a limit, and I think it's very important that we feel when we're starting to reach it. Because when we go over it, it, it might be when PTSD comes in, or even worse. So, yeah. Madison, I think this goes back to the question that you made about preparation. We have to be prepared mentally as well as physically for all the things that you're going to encounter. And you know, as all of you had stated here the first time that you saw a, a tragedy or a war zone experience, you weren't prepared for it. I don't think that you are. Um, we are learning more about PTSD and we're learning more about the other evolutions of uh, this, this psychological impairment. Um, there's another aspect of it called moral injury. And I've been doing a lot of reporting on this right now. PTSD is usually uh, premeditated by something that we witness. We, we witness a, a tragic situation or a, you know, a horrific situation where we see someone get killed. Uh, and that haunting image stays with us forever. We see a, a, you know, a horrible tragedy, natural disaster, something like that. Moral injury is what we do in a conflict or a, a disaster zone. Did we make the right moral decisions or did we choose the wrong decision? If you're a soldier, it could be killing an innocent civilian by accident or killing someone on purpose um, that you know, had already surrendered. As a journalist, this can affect us as well. How do we behave in a war zone? Did we put our camera down and did we help someone when they needed it, when they needed to be um, bandaged up because they were bleeding from a wound, or did we walk away from them? You know, we see situations like this all the time where we encounter real moral dilemmas uh, on the battlefield, in the war zone, and in our daily lives. How we react really will determine our psychological mental health for a long time to come. Um, if you can live with walking away from a person that needs your help, um, and just taking the picture instead, then you know I, I suppose that you can do that. You know that that is our job. But if you can't, then I would highly recommend that you know you help them, or, or maybe try to do both. Um, but make sure that you can live with whatever your actions are, because that I that side of it, not just witnessing horrible things, but making the wrong moral choice, can be something that follows you for the rest of your life. Okay. With that, we're going to open up to questions. Uh -huh. uh, we have time for three questions. Please keep your Questions pretty concise and to the point, please. Um, I see. Hi, my name is Chewan Cho from Seoul, South Korea. Uh, I want to ask you about all of you about how the families or relatives of all of you having concerns when you decided to dispatch to the war zones or the disaster zones. Are there having so much concerns about that, and how do you persuade them? If all of you got any like messages from the negative voices, how do all of you persuade them? So please tell us very specifically, not specifically, just briefly about that, please. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't think my, my parents knew what I was doing, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Uh, my mom freaked out, uh, as mothers would, but my father was like, good, you got to go tell the story of what's really happening there. And then once I got there, after a week, he's like, are you okay? Like, uh, call me every day. Um, because he understood, like, it's a dangerous place. I was in Baghdad, for God's sake. So he didn't, he just didn't make the connection. Um, he was just really, and they never really figured out what I did for a living. It's very hard to, to describe. And that's, that's part of the problem sometimes. Uh, you feel, you know, you can't relate to your family. And so you just, you're off. 
you know, you're off constantly, and it's very hard to communicate what you're going through to your own family. My wife is also a journalist, so it's never, you know, that's that's where we connected. Um, but with my parents, it was it was difficult, um, and and I don't, you know, they never understood it, but they're much happier at what I'm doing now. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I see the girl in the pink. Well, well, um, I know we've tackled this issue a bit through other questions, but um, c as, as a kind of to sum a bit, like, what do you think is the virtue, or are virtues and traits the most important to um, cover those situations? Because basically, this is like those are not. I'm sorry, um, we can't hear you very well. Can you speak up? So what do you think is the best virtue or most important virtue to cov like to be a war or disaster journalist? Um, by virtue, do you mean like a Virtue or trace, like uh, what kind of uh, characteristic? Yeah, like a quality? As, yeah, quality as a journalist. You should answer as well. People probably realize Madison has covered <laughs> disasters herself, the uh, recent ferry sinking in, in South Korea, so please. Um, I think one of the most important traits to have is empathy, because you know, you're there covering a story, and it's not about you, it's about the people who are on the ground and who owe you nothing, and basically you're taking something from them, but what are you giving back in return? So I think one of the most important traits, rather than you know, you know, having this bravado and going into some sort of dangerous situation is just to be able to connect with human beings like you would for any other story. Um, and one more question. Um, the one gentleman wearing the Wits University shirt. My name is Frederick Mujira. I'm from Uganda. I'd like you guys to talk about uh, verification of a story during the front line. Wh whom do you trust? Do you trust the rebels? Do you trust the government spokesperson? I've covered several stories about uh, war in Uganda, the Kony war. But you know, sometimes you find it is so hard for you to go to the war side, where the rebels are. The government will brand you a rebel, and they will charge you with the, uh, being a terrorist. Then whom do you trust? Do you trust the government spokesperson, or are you able to access the rebels? If I can kind of address that directly, I, I went to Uganda in 2006, and I looked for Kony, um, and I looked with the UPDF. So, you know, hey, are they telling you the truth or not, the Ugandan People's Defense Forces? Um, I, I couldn't trust them, and I certainly couldn't trust, you know, Kony's people, but you're looking for access. And I knew I could get where I needed to go if I went with the Army, with the UPDF. Um, and so you trust them as far as, you have to, you know. I, I trusted them logistically at that moment, but I didn't trust everything that they were telling me, um, unless you get to a, kind of an emotional level with them and you talk to the soldiers at, at a very personal level. I said, you know, what would you feel like if you have to shoot one of these child soldiers? Because well, I have my own kids, you know. It certainly gives me pause, and I've seen that before. I've I've had my gun pointed at them. You know, that's a pretty honest response. I'm not asking him a policy question, I'm asking him a personal question, and that you can trust, I think, a little bit more implicitly than you can otherwise. But it, it's difficult, you know, you have to verify, and especially um, as we all kind of worked as individuals uh, in, in these battlefields or in these disaster zones, you may not have backup. You know, you need people that can help you to vet these things. Um, you need a macro view when you're definitely in a micro view. You're in the field and you may not see things very clearly at that point. You're looking for a, a broader perspective. Um, but I, I think that's where working with other people can certainly help. Okay, and with that, please thank our panelists who are so generous with their time and their stories. And also a round of applause for Madison Park. Thank you very much, everyone.